Well, she's just a young girl from a little podunk village in Galilee called Nazareth. No one really cares about Nazareth, but that's where she's from. The name Nazareth might come from when the founders of the city were looking forward to a time when the future Messiah, the branch of David, would come. And so the word for branch is Netzer. And Nazareth may come from Netzer, the branch of David, a time of looking forward to when the Messiah would come. But even if that story is true, that was a long, long time ago. And nobody really thinks much about Nazareth today. So what does this young teenage Jewish girl from this backwater town have to look forward to in life? Marriage. She is engaged. She is betrothed to a really nice young man with a good job as a craftsman. He works with the most readily available building material, which is primarily stone, maybe a little wood, but mostly stone. And he's got a good steady job, so this is a good situation for them. What's more, he's from a good family, and he worships God faithful, and he even has a kind heart. And for a a young girl from Nazareth, this is a pretty good future she has mapped out for her. But then it happens. The moment that will change Mary's life and her family's life forever. And after this, nothing will be the same. She's minding her own business, probably doing some household chores, still living with her parents, when all of a sudden, right in front of her, boom, there appears a full-grown man. What is he doing there? I don't know if he puffed in with a puff of smoke or if he just sort of appeared like a teleporter in Star Trek or how, but all of a sudden he was just right there in front of her. What is she thinking? What is she going to do? I can tell you what I would be thinking. Run. But that's not what she does. Because she knows that this is no ordinary man. She's frightened, but not frightened because this looks like some dangerous intruder. She's frightened because she can tell there's something special about this person. This is an angel. His name is Gabriel. And he's on a special mission from God to deliver a message, the most important message that would ever be given to humankind. He's not in disguise because it's clear this is an important official message from God. He's an angel. So Mary talks with Gabriel for a little while, probably more than what we know. The biblical accounts are condensed versions of what really happened. It's, it's not everything we would like to know, but it's just what we need to know. And maybe one day we'll get the rest of the story so that we can understand exactly what was happening. But from what we get of this conversation, we learn some incredible principles about how we should respond to God in challenging situations. Because Mary is about to face a big one. Maybe some of you are dealing with difficult situations today. Maybe things that God is asking you to do that you're not quite sure if you can do. Or you're not sure what it's going to look like. And it's a little bit scary. It's a little bit frightening. This is the situation that Mary finds herself in today. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we pray and ask God to teach us through his word this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would guide us into all truth today that you would open up our hearts to hear the message that you have for us, that you would use your Holy Spirit to communicate truths, maybe beyond what I am saying, to each individual heart, listening to this in this room, or out in the lobby, or watching online, wherever they are, watching this after the fact. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts to help us to better understand who you are, how you want to interact with us, and how you want us to respond to you, Lord. Guide us into that this morning, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I wonder if you've ever felt like that. Like your whole world is being turned around, turned upside down by something that you didn't expect and God is inviting you to be a part of something that you've never done before, a challenging situation, something that you were drawn into, maybe feel forced into, didn't go into by choice, and all of a sudden you just find yourself drawn into it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then you know that God has allowed this to happen in your life. But you may be wrestling with, how am I going to go through this? How am I going to respond to this? What kind of a posture or attitude do I need to have 
as I engage with what God is doing in my life right now. Because there are some very difficult situations, very complicated situations, that we are wrestling with as people. It's a broken world after all. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn from this young Jewish girl named Mary and her response to God. So I want to pick up her story in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. You can follow along in your Bibles. I'll put it on the screens for you. It's also in the YouVersion Bible app if you want to go there and click on events, click on First Free Church. You'll find it there. Luke chapter 1, verse 28, says this. Gabriel appeared to her, Mary, and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. Two times, Gabriel tells Mary, you have found favor. You are favored by God. Why would he need to say this? Sometimes when I call my kids over to me, their first reaction is not, oh, dad's going to tell me something good. Sometimes it's, what did I do? Right? And they're wondering, okay, what did I do wrong? He's bringing me over here. What did I do wrong? And I have to reassure them and say, no, 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 this is a good thing. Don't worry. This is a good, I can see that look on your face. This is a good thing. Don't worry. And that's what's going on with Mary right here. When this angel appears, Mary's mind is racing all over the place. What could this mean? What is about to happen? Why is this angel here? And in Nazareth of all places, what is about to go down here? And she's not sure what's happening. And the angel sees this and clearly sees that there's a need to kind of push pause on those thoughts that she has of of wondering and, and fear. And so he says, don't be afraid. This is a good thing. You are favored. God is favoring you. That word favor is the word for grace. It's the word charis. God's grace is with you. This is a good thing. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. And I want you to notice here a contrast between the story of Mary and what Steve talked about last week with the story of Zechariah. There's a huge contrast taking place between these two stories, and they're put together for a reason, so that we can see one response from Zechariah and one response from Mary that seem very similar and with similar situations, but very, very different outcomes. See, it's the same angel, first of all. It's Gabriel. And he delivers a very similar message to Zechariah, but in a different place. Zechariah, this was six months prior, was in Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of David. He's in the temple, the place where God comes and connects directly with people. In fact, Zechariah was from the order of Abijah, and he was serving by special lot in the, to go into the sanctuary of the Lord. He had this special privileged place and position and everything about this was right. I mean, if you would ever expect an angel to come and deliver a message about the coming Messiah, this was the man and the place and the time that it would happen. A privileged role that Zechariah had. Not some young girl in the boondocks of Galilee. Mary gets this message in insignificant little Nazareth. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. This is a big message in a little place. What an incredible thing for Gabriel to deliver this to Mary. And here's what he says. You will give birth to a son. So far, so good. That's an incredibly honorable thing for a young woman who is of marrying age to be told you will give birth to a son. Some women, like Zechariah's wife, went their whole life without ever giving birth to a son, and it was a shameful thing for them. So for young Mary to hear an angel say, you will give birth to a son, this is great news. This is a good thing. So far, so good. Then he says, you will name him Jesus. Okay, a little bit controlling for you to pick the name. Normally I get to do that, but Jesus is a good name. It's been a very popular name around here for, for a few hundred years. Uh, it comes from Yehoshua or Joshua, which comes from the words Yahweh saves. It means deliverer or rescuer. This is a good name. All right, I can work with that. He will be great, Gabriel says, and will be called the son of the most high. And I have to think that Mary at this point is going, where is this going? 
Like, what are you talking about? The son of the most high. That's an incredible honor and incredible privilege to think that my son would have that kind of title from this little place in Nazareth. How could this be? And then he says, the Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will rule over Israel and his kingdom will never end. That escalated quickly. This went from you're going to have a son to here's what you're going to call him to he's going to be called the son of the most high to his kingdom will never end. He's going to pick up where David left off. He's going to have that throne, that kind of royalty, that kind of privilege. And for Mary, this is a lot to take in. The questions are just swirling around in her mind. How on earth is this going to happen? What does this mean? I'm supposed to be married less than a year from now. What kind of implications does this have for that? Does that mean that Joseph and I will get pregnant right after we get married and God's gonna give some special privilege to that boy? It kind of sounds like he's saying, I'm gonna get pregnant right away. How is that gonna work? And so Mary says, how can this happen? I am a virgin. And this is where I really want to draw your attention to the contrast between Mary's story and Zechariah's story. Because it's eerily similar to what Zechariah was told by the angel six months prior. An angel appears, a human gets scared, the angel says don't be afraid, delivers a message from God about a baby who will be really awesome. The human asks a question and the angel makes him not able to speak for nine months. So if that's where this story is going, then Mary has a problem here. And it sounds like her response is very, very similar to what Zechariah said. In fact, I want to take you back there just so you can see this. And in case you weren't here last week, we're going to go back to verse 11 of Luke chapter 1 so we can refresh our memories about this story of Zechariah. It says, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing right in front of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah, just like with Mary. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Very, very similar. You will have great joy and gladness. This is a good thing. Favor on you from God, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of Of the Lord. And then if we jump to verse 18, we see Zechariah's response. How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also along in years. You notice he put that in a very delicate way. (laughs) Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. Can't you just feel the disgust in Gabriel's voice? You have to understand, angels are not like God. Angels are not omniscient. They're not all-knowing. They're not omnipotent. They're not all-powerful. Angels have limitations on what they can know and what they can do and where they can go and what they're made for. And this is the most important message that this angel Gabriel will ever make except for the one he'll do in six months about Jesus. This is a big deal for him. This is what he's made for. This is the big dance, the big show. This is like, this is, the su- this is the big game for him, right? And here he is, and he's done his job perfectly. I mean, everything he's supposed to do, deliver this incredible message. And instead of Zechariah going, wow, you're the best, Gabriel, he goes, how can I be sure this will happen? And Gabriel's a little bit disgusted. And I can't blame him. You know, he's thinking, This guy just disrespected me. He's saying he's not sure if he even believes what I said. And I don't know how angel technology works, right? They, they, I don't know if if there's any kind of telepathy going on there. I don't know if they can just communicate, if they can just phone up God. I'm sure their technology is at least as good as ours, okay? And so Gabriel probably got on his angelic harp phone or whatever it is and just sent a quick message back to his boss saying, hey, this guy just disrespected me. Can I smite him? Like, what, is, what are my limitations here, you know? Or maybe God prepared him ahead of time. Maybe when God gave this instruction to Gabriel, he said, now, by the way, I'm not saying this is gonna happen because, you know, you're, you don't know the future or anything. But just in case Zechariah doesn't believe you at first, here's what you can do, right? Maybe that's what happened, I don't know. 
But somehow, Gabriel decides to drop the hammer on Zechariah. And he says, but now since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. These are two very similar situations, aren't they? But Mary's turns out quite a bit different. See, Mary did not ask, how can I know this will happen? Mary asked, how can this happen? How will this happen? I know that sounds very, very similar, but it's actually very distinct. Zechariah's question basically says, prove it. Mary's question basically says, how are you going to do it? Do you see the difference between those two questions? One says, I don't believe you and I want a sign to show me that it's going to actually happen. And Gabriel says to Zechariah, I'll give you a sign. I'll make you mute for nine months. And the other question says, okay, I'm with you. I believe you. But how exactly is this going to happen? And I wonder if Mary was actually curious about the timeline, right? Because she's going to be married in several months, okay? The opportunity to have a child is going to happen right there. But it sure sounds like this angel is talking about something right away, more imminent than that. And so she gets this sense that that maybe this timeline needs to be accelerated in some way. And so if she's going to have this incredible baby... It's probably going to be with Joseph. I mean, that's what she's thinking. That's what makes sense. And then God's going to put some special kind of grace and power in him. And that's a pretty easy win. But the wedding is still several months off. And the venue is booked out quite a ways. How are we, you know how that goes. How are we going to, are we just going to have to bump this up? Are we going to have to elope? What are we going to do to make this possible? How will this happen, she wants to know, since I am a virgin right now? That's a pretty practical question, right? It takes two to tango. How are we going to have this kid if it's not going to happen several months from now? Sounds like he's operating on an accelerated timeline. And the, the angel replies to her, not with condemnation for her question, but with an answer. In fact, it's such an incredible and unique answer. It's really different than most of what we see in the Bible. We all know that God can work in mysterious ways and that we don't always know how he's going to do it. And every now and then, he allows us, he pulls back the curtain to see a little glimpse into exactly how he's going to do it. And this is one of those rare moments where Gabriel is actually going to reveal to her exactly how this is going to happen, which is really, really amazing. It's how God is going to interact with a human to, to have Jesus be born. It's, it's how this miracle is going to happen of spiritual interfacing with physical. And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit is going to make the baby. No human partner required And because the the Holy Spirit is making this baby, there's not going to be any sinfulness in this baby, like every other human that's born. There won't be any of that natural sinfulness. He will be holy. He will be set apart. He will not just be the son of humans. He will be the son of God. And then he goes one step further. And he gives her the sign that she never asked for. Zechariah asked for a sign. Mary did not. She just said, how's it going to happen? And so Gabriel is actually going to give Mary now a sign, which is an incredibly gracious thing for her with what she's about to go through. He says, what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for the word of God will never fail. I want you to notice Mary's response in verse 38. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. What an amazing response for a young teenage girl who's just had an encounter with a spiritual agent of God that 99.9999% of people on this planet have never had in their lifetimes. She has this, receives this earth-shattering news that's going to turn her world upside down. And she says, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. 
I want to come back to that response in a minute. But I want you to see it in light of what's going to happen later in this chapter. Because we're going to get a little extra that points back to Mary's response here as we move on in the chapter. So we're going to pause on that and, and hold that in your mind, Mary's incredible response here. And let's keep reading in verse 39. Because Mary's going to take a trip. She's going to head to the hill country of Judea, to where Zechariah and Elizabeth live. And it's actually not that far from Bethlehem, which is important later in the story. We'll see in the next couple weeks. She's going to head to the hill country of Judea to go visit her relative Elizabeth. She probably got permission from her parents to do this. Here's what it says. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Now, I don't know if you've ever been pregnant. I have not. But I understand that it's pretty easy, especially later in the pregnancy, to feel the baby moving around. And Elizabeth, at this point, has just felt baby John do something like a somersault or something. Whatever it was, it was enough of an indication that she went, whoa, that was different. This is special. And she's filled with the Holy Spirit in this experience. And she had actually been in seclusion for the last five months. Here's a woman who is up there in years, has never had a child. It's a very shameful thing for her to be considered barren. And we don't really know what the situation was. The angel doesn't even say she was barren, just said people thought she was barren. And maybe it was Zechariah's fault, we don't know. But at any rate, they didn't have a child. And now she finally has a child. And she's so overwhelmed by the experience that she goes into seclusion for five months where she is probably spending an awful lot of time in prayer and meditating on the prophecy that was spoken to Zechariah. How this baby boy that she is carrying right now is gonna do something great for God and is gonna prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. What an incredible honor. What an incredible privilege that she has. And then... Mary, her cousin, her much younger cousin, walks in with a miraculous baby of her own and Elizabeth connects the dots. And she realizes that this baby that Mary is carrying, that is the one that her son is going to go tell people is coming. What an amazing thing to realize. And I want you to notice that this is the first time we see any person recognizing Jesus incarnate in the flesh as the Lord. Elizabeth recognizes that this is the Lord. She says that you're the mother of my Lord. She knows that this is a different kind of baby. This is God with us. Think about how Mary is feeling in this moment. How relieved she must be. This young Jewish teenage girl who suddenly finds out she's pregnant out of wedlock with a pretty crazy story that maybe not everybody believes. And her whole world is turned upside down, but she still trusts in God. And then she goes to her uh, cousin Elizabeth, and Elizabeth gets it and believes her and understands what she's going through. And then to have your much older cousin tell you, you are the mother of my Lord. That was especially significant for a young Jewish girl. But Elizabeth doesn't stop there. She goes on to say, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Unlike my husband, the mime. He wasn't so sure. Look what happened to him. Good thing he's going to get his voice back in a few months here. You didn't know how, you didn't know when, you didn't know the specifics, but you still believed that God would do what he said he would do, that he would be faithful to his words. And that is hope. Hope does not mean we have all the answers. Hope does not mean we know the why. It doesn't mean everything's going to happen according to our calendar. Hope says, I don't necessarily know why this is happening or when this will happen or how exactly this will all work out, but I trust. 
I believe that God is doing something in this and that is hope. I choose to believe that God is at work here and that is my hope. Now Christmas is a season of hope, right? And Advent, is the, it's a whole season of hopeful anticipation. That's what it's all about. But the reality is that we live, you and I live, in a broken, messed up world with all sorts of problems. And, and you are sitting here today or watching online and you have all sorts of issues darting around your mind that distract you from what God wants to do in your life. Sometimes we're faced with difficult circumstances that we have no idea how we're gonna get through. Like God has asked us or, or forced us to walk through a time that we don't know if we're gonna make it out on the other side. And what is this gonna do to us? And what is this gonna do to our, our faith? Christmas can be a very bittersweet time, can't it? See, for some of us, Christmas is a time of mourning loved ones who we've lost. And there's something about that Christmas time when the family's supposed to be together and not everybody's there. It's an incredibly difficult time. My wife and I actually lost two babies a few years ago just before Christmas. It, it made it a very, very difficult Christmas. It's awful. And there are other people who are struggling with terminal illnesses, right? And so they're facing what may be their last Christmas and they're wondering, am I gonna have another year to spend with my family? What is going to happen here? Incredibly difficult circumstances. Other people are struggling with mental illnesses or depression or anxiety or different things that, that are just kind of taking over your life and they're such a distraction. And so we have all these kinds of problems, broken relationships, relationships with spouses or, or children or friends, different things like this. And we look at everybody else's pictures online and we think, I wish I could have a family like that. Like their family looks awesome. Christmas is supposed to be this wonderful time of warm fuzzy feelings and matching pajamas. And, and here I am without any of that. And I feel like I'm missing out on something. Or I feel like God is leading me into a season that's very difficult. Or I'm right in the middle of a season that's very difficult for me. And so Christmas can be very bittersweet for us because we, we're left to wonder, God, why is this happening to me? What are you doing right now? What are you working in my life? It's in those times that I think we need to look to this little teenage girl from this podunk village in Nazareth who had her entire world turned upside down. And not to look at her as some sort of, of divinity or some sort of extra special person who because of how wonderful she was found favor with God. That's not what the text says. The text says that God favored her, gave grace to her, she didn't earn it. She didn't deserve it. He came to her and said, I'm going to put my grace on you. We need to look to her and learn from her response to what the angel Gabriel brought to her. Here she is, pregnant out of wedlock. Everything in her life, her whole plan is in jeopardy, right? Her marriage, what's going to happen there? Her reputation in this little village where everybody knows everybody, what's going to happen there? Her parents, what are they going to think? If you put yourself in her shoes 2,000 years ago in the Jewish culture, in this family, as a teenage girl who's already engaged and now she's starting to show, what is this gonna do to her life? And her response to all of this is may it all be to me as you have said, I am the Lord's servant. Incredible faith, incredible trust, incredible hope. Because as Elizabeth said, you believed. You are blessed because you believed. And that is what God calls us to do. To believe in him, to trust in him, even when life circumstances turn our world upside down. Even when we face difficulties that we don't understand and cannot predict and don't know the why behind them. Why, God, is this happening to me? Or why is this happening to my loved one? And sometimes God gives clarity and says, this is how it's going to happen. But many times he does not. And we don't have all the answers. And that's when we need to choose to believe. There's an incredible song 
written by a group called Phillips, Craig, and Dean. How many of you are familiar with Phillips, Craig, and Dean? Anybody? One of them actually lives in St. Louis, and I got to chat with him a little bit this week about this song. And I want to hear more, because it's, it's, it, a few years ago, it became one of my favorite songs. I love it. I want to close today's service by reading the lyrics of this song. And as I do that, our band is going to come out here, and we're going to play a closing song after this. It's not this song, but we'll play a song that kind of this builds into. And then we're gonna do something special after that, so don't go anywhere right away. But I want you to think about the lyrics to this song. Think about whether you can say this to God right now. This might be a, a prayer for you or just something to ponder and think about. But let me share with you this, this song. It didn't take long for my whole world to change. One phone call now, life will never be the same. It's like I'm watching my whole world go dark. Nothing makes much sense. But still with all my heart, I choose to believe and never give up hope. God is good and he's in control. I'll keep the faith I trust in his ways, and even when his face is hard to see, I choose to believe. It's easy to believe when everything goes our way, but we're all gonna go through fires to test our faith. Life hurts so much that we can hardly breathe. We're begging to know why, but it's such a mystery. I choose to believe.